I mean, so no, 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 I mean the age that they get. <laughs> It varies. You know, I mean, early on, a lot of uh, teenagers and young adults were making that decision. And then as we've gone along and the program has been successful, what people have done well with managing rejection, uh, more transplants have been done in younger children. Holmes, can I answer that question? Yeah. That's my question. So, hi. Thank you, Chapman. So, uh, most surgeons don't want to transplant a child less than five kilos, which is usually about three to four months of age. Many of the, of the transplant surgeons would prefer someone to be 10 kilos, and it's because of the surgical issues of having to connect everything. So bigger sometimes is a little bit health, more helpful to prevent complications. Well, that's, uh, I mean, that was a part of the story. Again, you talk about uh, learning from a case study. The first liver transplant was not done to cure MHP. It was done because the girl who had liver failure had liver failure because a naturopath had given her a bottle of vitamin A and uh, her mother destroyed her liver by giving her hypothesis of vitamin A. It's one of the few really dangerous vitamins. And the mother was so guilty about this that she just couldn't let this child die. So we found, decided to do a liver transplant. And after the transplant, her recovery was remarkable and her disease was well controlled. And she became the, the first case where we really had an understanding about how liver transplant affected the control of amino acids in, in that disease and led to this whole uh, program that really has reshaped the way Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh thinks about the use of liver uh, treatment. The other thing that was done, sort of serendipity that surprises people to know, is that we can use the liver of a child with maple syrup ear disease in a normal child. So we did domino transplants. Uh, the first transplant like that was done at UCLA. It was, it was a man who was dying of liver cancer, and they came in and said, we're doing a transplant on this patient with maple syrup ear disease. Do you want the liver? And he said, why not? What do I have to lose? And you know, it turned out that he tolerated the, the abnormal liver very well. I mean, the liver is abnormal. But Enzyme activity in muscle and other places takes care to buffer the amino acids. So there's really very little consequence of doing that in terms of metabolic control. You don't give somebody another disease. Well, that gets a little off the track. This, this slide is a little dated. 2012, 1990 and 2012, we had 600, 267 admissions to the Lancaster General Hospital, community hospital, to take care of children who were sick with MSUD. Why were they there? Talk about episodic illness. Well, they were there for all the reasons you know about. But when you think about what it takes to change the natural history of a disease, to understand what you have to control as a physician and a parent, and to prevent somebody from having catastrophe, you have to look, well, why do they get sick? Well, they get sick for all the reasons people get sick. A lot of gastroenteritis, rotavirus, rotatec as a vaccine has been a godsend for MSUD. Ear infections, strep, common infections. People also get appendicitis. They also break their legs. And so trauma and even things like cholecystitis and ovarian torsion, uh, all these are problems that have to be dealt with clinically in a group of patients who have these diseases. And wherever you take care of you have to be prepared to deal with problems like that that cause them to decompensate metabolically. And we can talk about this list in terms of all the diseases that we're talking about today. Every organic acidemia, every fatty acid oxidation effect is couched by the same thing. And I would just take a moment to say, immunizations, preventing infection, is one of the major things that we can do as clinicians and as parents to limit severe infections. In the place I'm working now, whooping cough is common. It drives me crazy. I've seen kids with whooping cough who have a difficult genetic disease to begin with, and we know that's a preventable disease. Having a clinic there, I think, will help us solve that problem. And having a clinician who's willing to say, get your children immunized, preventing infections is part of our important job. So if you think about what determines the natural history of these diseases, infection, injury, and the resources you have to take care of those problems when they show up.
There are two forms of the tartaric acid urea in the Amish. It's unfair. You know, when I went to Lancaster County, I wanted to test newborns for the tartaric acid urea. And why did I want to do that? Anybody who knows about that disease knows the answer. Because if you only study that disease in children who are disabled, you will never learn to treat it. The disability is severe. It's a stroke of the basal ganglia. It's destruction of the basal ganglia. You can't even understand the chemistry if you don't start with a healthy child. So I essentially wanted to find some healthy children when I went to Lancaster County because I thought that I could keep them from going through that crisis or I knew that that was the only way to learn how to treat the disease. And um, the reason for doing newborn testing was to find healthy children see if we could keep them that way. Uh, Steve Goodman told me I was crazy. Steve is a good friend. He reviewed my grant at National Institute of Health uh, about the tartaric acid urea. He knew what I was trying to do. And he said, Morton, you're crazy. He said, those brains are abnormal when kids are born. He says, you're never going to treat that disease. And he came out to the clinic in Lancaster County about 1993. I don't know, we had a we had a family meeting there. We went out to this Amish farm, and a 14-year-old girl who was an asymptomatic lutearic acid urea type 1 gave Steve his Amish pretzel. It was a religious experience for Steve Goodman to come to Lancaster County and meet all these kids with lutearic acid urea who he thought were dead. Many of them he had diagnosed. They lived in New York State and Ohio and other places, and they came in for this meeting, and he knew the names of many of them. And there they were. Many of them were disabled, but they weren't gone. And it was really, it was really something for Steve to see those children. And by that time, we had that meeting at Ruthie's place. Now Ruthie, in this period, is 39 years old. Uh, when you think about preventing GA1, uh, the entry of GA1, think about what difference it makes. You know the difference. Um, talk about statistics. You know, we all like big data, or some people like more than others, but here's a nice statistic. This is the first girl picked up with newborn screening, urine sample, the sixth sample I ran through a mass spectrometer using K Tanaka's method. And her sister, who was diagnosed a couple years later, and then this is Michael Metal, K son. How many have seen this picture? It's used by the CDC, right? Used by the CDC to encourage newborn screening. But, you know, when we started on newborn screening in Lancaster County and found Barbie and kept her healthy, um, there was some criticism for using genetic testing on asymptomatic children to look for a disease for which there wasn't a good treatment protocol. We never would have learned to treat this disease and never would have been motivated to expand the newborn screening if it weren't for her. Now she's in her late 20s, I think she has two or three children now. Her sister is also married. One of those interesting things we've learned about this disease over the years, a mother with lutearic acid urea can have a baby, and the baby's fine. The lutearic acid of the mother doesn't poison the baby. Now, I mentioned earlier, there are actually two kinds of glutaric acid in the Amish. So when I was running urine samples, I found all these kids had very high urine levels of glutaric acid. And in Tanaka's system, that would be, you know, 600 milligrams per gram of creatinine. A lot. Not just a little bit, a lot. And they were fine. And to make a long story short, once we started doing newborn screening using glutaryl carnitine to look for it, we stopped seeing the other type of glutaric acid urea because it was present in the urine. The glutaric acid was high in the urine, but those patients don't make glutaryl carnitine. And they don't make 3-hydroxyglutarate, which allowed me to differentiate between those with this benign variant and those with this severe variant. There was a student named Eric Sherman 
15 years old, who came from Ephrata High School and wanted to do a science fair project. And Eric Puffenberger gave him the project of finding the gene for this other form of Lutheric Acidaria. And it's called Lutheric Acidaria Type 3. It's a long, interesting story, including the fact that Eric's the only 15 year old to ever have a poster of the genetics meetings. <laughs> and he actually knew what he had done when, and he found the gene. And it's, um, it's glutaryl coa synthetase, which is really an interesting gene. It's a very common disorder around the world. Mike Bennett, who Dr. Ronaldo mentioned during his talk, is a good friend of mine, he had seen a case in a Pakistani girl in London, this benign form of lateric acid ray. And when I first showed him the chromatogram of the Amish kids, he said, I bet that's just a benign form. Well, it didn't take long until we knew there was type one severe form, but it took years before we figured out what the second type was. But what's interesting about that is the lateric acid is formed in the mitochondria probably with alpha keto dehydrogenase, forms lateric acid, and then glutaryl CoA synthetase makes it into a CoA compound. And the children type three, they can't make that CoA compound. Why is that important? That tells us what the toxic metabolite is. And for people who like to do drugging, if you would target glutaryl CoA synthetase and inhibit that, that would be a nice treatment or type 1 lutaric acid area. It's a very interesting piece of natural history that again, just by being present, doing the testing, having a laboratory, thinking about that, uh, we gain insight into the natural history of the disease. Treatability. This is what happened to outcomes. Of the 20 kids I saw in 19, uh, 88, and that year, 95% uh, were disabled. There was one girl who escaped injury, and she was the one who gave us all hope that it would be possible to treat this if we just found them when they were asymptomatic, figured out what happened, and then prevented that stroke. And it was this one girl right here that gave Steve Goodman that pretzel, and he had seen her here, and he knew she really had it. We actually found the gene mutation for the Amish variant. Uh, using that family, and she was the sister of that little girl, Ruthie, or that young woman, Ruthie, that I showed in the first slide. This little boy is Emmanuel. Uh, this photograph is done by a famous photographer named Bill Coleman. Anybody that's really interested in photography of Amish children, Bill was a fabulous child photographer. He got to be very good friends of this family and came into their home and into their community and did this fabulous pictures, not only of disabled children, but of normal children. But about 2005, another interesting thing happened that changed the way we think about this disease. Again, it gets to this idea of a single observation being critical sometimes in the development of insight into these diseases. And it was that Cheryl Greenberg in Manitoba had a children with a very severe form of lateric acid area that seemed to be untreatable. And some autopsies were done on those children when they died. Uh, George Hoffman and some others in Germany analyzed the lateric acid content of the brain, and they found that the brain tissue itself had lateric acid concentrations a thousand times higher than spinal fluid or blood. And that completely changed our model. We immediately, when we saw that manuscript, realized that the strategy for treating this disease had to change. And going from here, about a two-thirds success rate to here, depended specifically on that insight. And the strategy changed. We went from trying to remove lateric acid by clearing it through the kidney or using carnitine, whatever, to trying to prevent the uptake of lysine into the nervous system. We started to look at this is a problem of lysine transport into the brain. This paper was uh, submitted in 2011. Think about that, 1988 to 2011. It was really about 2007, maybe 2008, when we began to have confidence that this approach was gonna make a difference in outcome. So 15 years, a long time. Uh, a lot of observations, but we got there. 
Um, this little girl is the first child diagnosed with newborn screening who was not Amish, diagnosed with GA1. And that's, that's a famous picture. Anybody ever seen that picture? Time Magazine. It's a nice picture. Your old Magazine. Yeah, and, it, and what's interesting about it is the light is on the wrong side of my face because the guy who did the picture set up this very artificial lighting system. It's like a Vermeer, you know. So. <laughs> but it was a beautiful picture. And, um, and this girl was so important in learning to treat this disease. For one thing, she had one copy of the Amish variant. Uh, and then she had another mutation that was characteristic of Turkey, uh, people from Turkey. Uh, she did what some of you may know about, which fell off a rocking horse, hit her head, and had a big intracranial hemorrhage. Happened about 15 months of age. And she also had punctate hemorrhages of the retina. So what happened? What would have happened if she hadn't been followed the plan for special children? Shaken baby. 10% of the kids I saw with GA1 came to us through the child abuse network. Subdural hemorrhages, subarachnoid hemorrhages, very common after minor head trauma or spontaneously. And it was Nikki who was flown from Allentown down to Leicester to be in our hospital, who you know gave us firsthand experience with that phenomenon. Uh, fortunately, she survived that ordeal. It's 2015, um, but it didn't stop there. She, uh, because of that injury and because of GA1, she had cysts right behind her ears, middle cranial fossa cysts, very characteristic on MRIs of kids with GA1. How many families from GA1 are here? Yeah. Headaches. Headaches. So Nikki had terrible headaches, and she had these big cysts. And they were in part related to that early hemorrhage, but they're also very characteristic of GA1. And if anybody knows anything about middle cranial fossa cysts, in some percentage of patients, they are associated with chronic headaches. And at times, you drain them. And a Dr. Lee uh, at Lehigh Valley was a neurosurgeon who had had experience with middle cranial fossa cysts. And after years of trying all the headache remedies we could think of and treatment of GA1 and everything else, Nikki underwent surgery to remove a middle cranial fossa cyst. And <clears throat> When she woke up, she said, it's the first time I remember not having a headache. This was, uh, it was like three or four years ago. And, I mean, she has been completely asymptomatic. And Dr. Lee said that cyst was a very thick wall cyst and adhered to the third cranial nerve. And he had to dissect it away from the nerve. You'd think the inflammation within the cyst and the tension on the nerve had caused the chronic headaches. So, you don't design studies like that. You find out things like that by solving problems. Uh, this little girl in Florida, uh, grandfather, called me and he was trying to organize to bring all these people up from Florida to Lancaster to see me and it was winter. And I said, you know, to bring 12 or 15 family members up here about this newborn with GA1 doesn't make sense. She's gonna come up here, she's gonna get sick and end up in our hospital. A lot easier for me to come to Florida. So I went down to see her at uh, Nicholas Children's Hospital, gave a talk about GA1, got her started on this formula that we developed, which is the subject of that paper we published. And uh, her grandfather at the time now sends me these videos and pictures of her. She's done beautifully. Uh, her parents are from Ecuador, and they are uh, Catholics from Ecuador. But she has one mutation that came uh, from the Sephardic Jewish population, probably a thousand years old, you know, when they left uh, Israel and came up into Europe uh, and then underwent persecutions and fled Europe and ended up going to South America and other places. So that gene traveled uh, through this Hispanic family uh, to South America. And then her other mutation was Arabic. And it was kind of an interesting experience for these families who were uh, serious Catholics to realize that they had this unusual heritage. And uh, so, but she was picked up by Florida's newborn screening program.